All right, everybody. So welcome back to another Bike James podcast. And I've got a uh, buddy of mine, good friend from across the border up north, Ryan Leach, famous writer. Now he's a, a, a coach and, and a father, and he's got all sorts of interesting things going on. So it's been a little while since I've had him on the podcast to talk writing and life and philosophy. He's definitely one of my favorite guests I've had on, just awesome conversations. And so uh, glad to have him back on. So Ryan, man, thanks for joining us again today. How's, uh, how's life treating you? It's great. We, yeah, I mean, life is good. Fatherhood. I mean, that's really been the theme this year. I've got a 10 month old baby daughter, so it's pretty cool transition. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, that is great. I mean, I haven't had you on. I mean, like I said, it's been, you know, 10 months that, that you've been a father. Uh, so I haven't had you on the podcast since you've been a father and so uh i guess we can kind of kind of start there um you know fatherhood is you, you mentioned that you're uh you've had to change some priorities and, and things like that with with having a kid and so um yeah man i guess just kind of give us a little bit of an update like kind of where you're at with you you know your your you know, being a father and just kind of life in general and, and just kind of where things are, are at for you right now mm -hmm. yeah Things are, well, transition is a good word for it. Obviously, the, the fatherhood life is just incredible and presents new challenges. My online business is going through a transition here. I'm actually behind the scenes working on a whole new platform that is going to marry together all the courses I've done and courses I'm developing tighter with the community of riders that have been gathering around all of my work for the past uh, bunch of years. So I'm super pumped about that. So that's a transition and that both, you know, really you combine those and they're all encompassing, not to mention trying to find time to actually ride my bike, which I would say that's perhaps the biggest challenge so uh yeah so i'm also one other one other transition that is just a arose is i've been sponsored by norco for 26 years and that contracts despite all this energy and momentum and and great energy with the online business that contracts coming to an end after 26 years so that's a big transition yeah, man, no, that's that's got to be uh, a, an interesting transition for you. You know, like I say, you've been with them for for 26 years, and you know, riding their bikes and helping to promote uh, their their stuff. And so, uh, you know, having waking up and being like, man, I don't have the same. It's kind of like uh, having the same, uh, you know, buddy along with you for 26 years on this journey that you've been and. And now all of a sudden you're uh, kind yeah. of flying solo in that arena. So that's got to gotta feel kind of interesting. Yeah, totally. And you say, buddy, it's interesting. And, you know, there's a big thing with sponsored riders, pro riders, anyone who's working the sponsorship game, it's relationship based, right? You have buddies in the bike industry and when they move around, the sponsorships often disappear. So you might have mm. a marketing manager you get along really well with. He leaves the company, a new one comes in and have they have their own ideas about how to spend the marketing budget. And Norco has gone through a lot of big changes in the recent years and especially this current year. So that's resulted in big changes on the team front. Yeah, yeah. No, I, man, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I know how that goes with you. Uh, you've got a relationship with somebody uh, somewhere, um, you know, like me, I, I used to have a pretty good relationship with the guys at Pink Bike and mm -hmm. uh, they, they cleaned house. Uh, it's been several years now, but, you know, it was definitely a different relationship mm -hmm. uh, with them. I mean, for years, man, I, I, I did a fitness article for them every month for like four four plus years you work with and, tyler Mayne uh, back then yep yep yeah 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 yeah, Tyler yeah. Great. tyler's good great great guy man and and uh yeah but the the new people came in and i just you know it wasn't quite the same uh value proposition for them and so you know they were always happy to have me provide free content for them 
Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, it, it just, it wasn't quite the same and I could just tell like the, yeah. the energy wasn't yeah. the same, the priority wasn't the same. And so, you know, some of those things shifted. I mean, I've had the same thing happen with a few other, uh, things, but yeah, that's interesting how it, it is. It's about the relationships that you have with people and, and they happen to work at a certain company or a certain brand. And mm -hmm. then if they move on, you know, you, you realize like, oh, it was really more about my relationship with that person than it was with this entity at large. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah. 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 It's interesting. Definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a business. I mean, it is a business. Same with the, same with the contacts at different magazines and outlets. I, I noticed a change seven years ago when I started my online business, I had a great relationship with a lot of the different magazines, online magazines, and the requests for them to post content about what I'm doing, even if it's useful, good content, became it became a, a much more challenging thing for me as a online business owner compared to a professional athlete business owner. It, you know, any pro athlete style content I shared with them, they'd of course post it. And that was a business for me. I wanted to get things posted and that's how I made money as a pro athlete. But the online business is more businessy and it's less entertainment based. So all of a sudden those relationships became, yeah, it was required of me to start paying to have my content seen and shown on those outlets. Yeah, so that yeah, was a transition. Yeah. That was a transition to a, a bunch of years ago. So, yeah, yeah, it's funny, man. It's it, it's it's funny how much people, you know, when they ride, like they don't really see the behind the scenes stuff, and they don't know exactly kind of how it works. But like, I had the same thing happen with uh, you know uh, pedaling innovations, kind of in reverse, right? Like when I was paying for advertising again with Pink Bike. Uh, mm -hmm. everything that I would post, every, every press release that I would put out, anything that I wanted to put out that had anything to do with the catalyst pedals and pedaling innovations, they were happy to run with. Uh, but then when I stopped advertising with them, uh, all of a sudden my press releases weren't, uh, as interesting. And sure. so it's a business. I mean, it's, I heard it. it's, it's yeah. a business. It's got to, yeah, yeah. they've got to do those things. I mean, that's how it works. Right. But unfortunately though, it creates this, this, image right because most writers don't yeah. realize that you yeah. know and so their impression is that these right. magazines or and websites are running what's best right like they're actually like checking and seeing like who's got the best content who's got the best products who's got the best bikes and so they think that like oh the more press you're getting from these entities the better these things must be when mm -hmm. they may be great products, but it usually has more of a reflection of how much money they're spending, th those companies are buying and advertising than it does with anything else. And, yeah. you know, and again, yeah, it, you see talks. this, yeah. money talks, yeah. I, mean, I remember in the fitness industry, you know, when I was, uh, the same thing, right? Like supplement companies pay for magazines and websites. And so it's, uh, you know, you see a, a, an article write up on this new supplement, and it probably has more to do with the fact that this new supplement just signed a big contract to do a lot of advertising with that website or magazine than it did with like this being a great new supplement or something like that. And so, but again, it creates confusion with consumers because if they don't understand and you know to take things with a grain of salt that they're seeing in the media, uh, mm -hmm. it can lead to an impression that isn't accurate. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, people don't, they don't see the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the behind the curtains, the backside of it, you know, like, yeah. I mean, clipless pedals are a great example, right? Like clipless pedals are, man, they're, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into flats. because We've, turned, you and I are we've both, turned the corner. We, I think we've turned we, the corner on the clipless flat pedal debate. There's been so much good quality content talking about all the things that we'd been talking about for years coming out and it's becoming known that yeah there's a there's a big difference and flat pedals aren't you know they're they're here to stay and they've got a place yeah yeah and that that is interesting well, how that they're has here to turned because i mean they were of course they're here to stay they were it was the original before clubless but right 
Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, again, you know, a lot of that, but um, yeah, getting back to your point though. Yeah. I totally, yeah. It's, it's, it's important for riders to know that there's a lot of behind the scenes action that affects what they're exposed to. And so, yeah. yeah and do you, do you do as much research, you know, as you, as a consumer as, as you can. And, uh, but yeah, anyway, back to that, I think <laughs> to, to loop it back to the, the entertainment style content i do have a pretty fresh charles bike that my buddy jeff lanowski he's got a he works closely with a company called reeb and so they they welded me up a nice steel trials bike and so i'm excited i'm inspired to do an action edit on the trials huh? bike so come coming coming back with uh with the trials edit and so if i if I post that edit, if I share that edit, that that'll get shared around and posted on on the sites. Just be, it's just pure. It'll just be pure entertainment, and and people yeah. like entertainment. That's we we like entertainment. Mountain biking is an entertainment based industry. That's for sure. It's a it's a hobby. I mean, this is not this is just fun hobby lifestyle. We're, that's that's the realm we're in when it comes down to it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's totally true, man. That's uh, um, it's interesting you met, you mentioned Jeff because I was thinking about uh, he, he actually I did some work with him back in the day, but I, but back in the day, like I mean, you were like you were the man. I mean, like as far as like trials riding went, I mean, you you pushed the the sport so far forward, man. When you were uh, riding and at your at your prime and and stuff and. And I was trying to think like, man, who, you know, was, was, you know, I remember Jeff did it too, but like, man, you're in yeah. like a, a, a kind of an, and again, I, I know you won't admit this cause you were, you're just way too humble of a dude, but that was like, there's Ryan Leach. And then there was like the other guys and <laughs> you know, the stuff that you were doing was just like, you know, like I said, it was, it was just at another, another level. And so, you know, a lot of riders who've gotten into riding in the last, you know, five you know, years or so, like they may not know, you know, exactly the impact that you had on our, on, on riding and, and mountain biking and uh, just, you know, the freaking. I, I remember how fucking awesome it was. Like every year we would wait for the new cranked video to come out or the, you know, you had the, uh, um, you know, new world disorder videos and, and all that stuff. And, and, you know, and every year, man, we, I, I loved watching your edits, man. It was just, it would just go up and up and up. And, you know, the, the year that you, you sessioned the, the railroad tracks, like that just blew my mind, man. You were just fucking jumping around, hopping around from one track to the other, doing 180s on those things. And I always remember, man, watching you thinking like, dude, I know he's riding a bike, right? Like it's technically the mm-hmm. same thing I am, but like mm-hmm. watching you ride, it was like, it was like you were just, you were, you were on something else. Like you were like you, your ability to ride the bike. It just made it look so much fun. And I was always so jealous of how much fun it looked like you were having uh, with just anything that like you could turn anything into a super fun uh, thing to, to play around with on your bike. And, yeah. you know, like I said, a lot of the stuff that you did really, you know, progress what we thought was possible with a, with a bike and uh yeah man it, it, you know it's really cool so if anybody's listening to this and you guys haven't seen you know some of ryan leach's edits like you know go google it and and go check out some some clips from some of his old uh you know videos and stuff and and uh you know just it's it's yeah it's pretty pretty awesome man so uh but anyways i've, I've always i've always appreciated that about you and just how humble you are and and now you're in the mode of like okay well now i want to share this with other people, which is what, you know, you started the Ryan Leach connection in order to help other riders be able to, uh, you know, increase their skills and experience that, that same type of fun as well. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, that's been, been, uh, been really cool to see. So yeah, man, I guess just kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, that transition from being like, you know, a groundbreaking rider uh, into more of a coaching role and helping other riders uh, discover what they're capable of. Mm-hmm, cool. Yeah, no, thanks, James. I appreciate that reflection. And also you talked about 
watching me, you could see that I was having fun. And a lot of that is you're watching me in flow. You're watching me in the zone, right? And so that's what you and a lot of the viewers pick up on because it's that state that a high level rider needs to be in when they're pulling off video part worthy lines. So vicariously, the viewers experiencing that and they're like, wow, that, you know, that is, they can feel it. And that's the, that's the inspiring part, you know, it's flow. And for me, it wasn't just flow, but it was, it was creativity, things that no one else had ever done before, riding moves that no one else had ever thought, had ever thought of. And then that combined with me needing to be in a flow state in order to perform them in a, in a successful and artistic, beautiful way. That was always the, the combo of qualities that I tried to put into a video segment. And, you know, that's actually the same thing with my online coaching business. Seven years ago, when I started Ryan Leach Connection, it was what inspired me was to do something no one else had ever thought of or done before. And that was creating these in-depth step-by-step courses for all the key technical mountain bike skills and tricks. And so I had tons of energy just putting that together and creating this, this online experience for riders and, and keeping it an alive experience. I wanted it to have connection. That's why connection was in the name. I wanted people to, to feel connected to me as the coach and also to, to each other on the site in a community space. And so since then, the business has certainly transcended just me. I've got a team of coaches and mentors and others that are creating content too. So the name's actually now changed it went from Ryan Leach Connection to RLC as an acronym because it was easier. And now it's an acronym, an acronym that stands for Ride, Learn, Connect. So RLC MTB. And so under that banner, yeah, there's a whole swath of courses. And on this new platform, RLC 2.0, that I'm about to launch, it's going to bring everyone even closer together and to be more intimate with all the content that has been created and is being created. So yeah, lots of good action on the online coaching on the RLC front. So yeah, I'm gonna be making some noise. I actually quit doing, quit marketing in the fall just so I could focus on this transition and creating new content and a new vision. And so I've just been busy behind the scenes creating. And so that's that's what's going on for, for RLC. Yeah. Yeah, man. So no, and it, you, that the connection part, man, the community part is something that I've, I've always uh, admired about what you've been able to do with that site. I mean, I had you know, many people mention, uh, you know, like, man, can you put something together like the, you know, Ryan Leach has with his site? And, and I'm like, man, no, cause I'm not Ryan Leach, right? Like it, you, there's something uh, I think unique about your passion and energy for for doing this that comes across right like you mm-hmm. said like we like people could tell that you were you you know the flow right that you were in when you were riding and i and i yeah. think that the members of your site can feel like your genuine interest in like not just a dollar sign right they're not just a mm-hmm. a number for you like you you take a real genuine interest in their progression and their enjoyment and and they can feel that and mm-hmm. and then you encourage people to also mentor other people, right? So it's not, yeah. it's kind of like, uh, you know, martial arts, right? Like after you've, yeah. you, you've been there for a little while, a new person comes in and you're able to to mentor them a little bit. And so that, and that makes them better, right? Like there's, uh, totally. I've written an article about this a couple of times. There's, uh, God, um, I forget where I read it, but the guy was saying there's three types of people that you need in your life to get better. And he was talking about, um it was Frank Shamrock, Ken Shamrock's brother. Uh, and he was talking about the three types of people you need in your life to be a great martial artist. And it's really, you know, Mm. to be great at anything, but it's like, you need someone better than you who can show you what's possible. You need Mm. someone the same as you, because it's kind of like that, like, you know, we're progressing together. We're in this together. Hey, if you can do it, I can do it. And like the most Mm. like 
you know, selfless, you know, yeah. way possible. And yeah. you need someone worse than you that you're bringing up. Right. Cool. And if you have all three of those people in your life, then yeah. you're going to progress at a much faster and take and take your skills to a much higher level than you will if you don't have one of those three people in your life. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of riders um, and people in general, right, like they don't, you know, the, the people who's better than them, they tend to get jealous of and, you know, they don't want them around because it makes them feel worse. Uh, you know, they don't like to bring yeah. blood because, you know, there's this attitude of like, you know, we, you know, I don't want to waste my time or why would I, you know, share my secrets with you? Cause I always want to be better than you. Cause there's always the, the, <laughs> the chance that that person who was once below you can like be, get, get to you and past you. Right. right. And so <laughs> I think a lot of riders just kind of get stuck in this, like, you know, this pool of similar riders and, and and don't uh, you know, go out of their way to make sure they've got these other people. I think that's what the Ryan Leach connection provides for people because they have you, right? They have these other mentors that you have who are, you know, probably better than them at what they're trying to do. And then you've also got people the same and you got the, the people that are able to help bring up. So I think that that element that you've, that, that connection that you've created is probably just as valuable as the content itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And honestly, that's why I'm. I recognize that, and I've recognized it from the beginning. I love that. I love that that three those three people in your life. I mean, that's that's definitely a foundation for sure to why RLC works so well and bringing that community element into play and really championing it and really highlighting it and doing everything I can to, to encourage that, that process is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And I, I, it's, it's a key way to also bring new life to all the courses and content that I've created. So I, just so you know, I'm actually, the, one of the things I'm doing in order to create this is I've got a private Facebook group for the paid members. And so the move is actually to take that group onto a new private platform that is also the same place where all of my courses are hosted. So they're going to be all in, it's going to be a, a nice flow between all of the content and community um, interaction. So that's, that's one of the key moves that is happening behind the scenes. So big migration. Yeah. Going on. Yeah. So. And that kind of, you know, segues into something that we, we've talked about a couple of times, because I mean, one of the reasons that you, you mentioned to me that you were uh, doing that, I mean, obviously the connection is better, but there's also the fact that right now you're hosting it on Facebook, which is a social media platform and mm -hmm. not everyone has that, you know, doesn't want to have a Facebook account. Um, you know, there's some, you know, pluses and minuses, social media, yeah. uh, that, you know, that, that, you know, you getting your own platform just kind of lets you, you know, you have your own thing. Like you don't have to worry about the, the social media stuff kind of creeping in, mm -hmm. um, as well. But I think, uh, the, the social media, that's something we, you know, when we've talked the last couple of times is, has come up how that has really changed uh, a lot of uh, you know changed writing a lot in the in the last few years uh, both you know for for good and bad but I guess kind of what's your what's your current take on you know social media and mountain biking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's so powerful. Social media algorithms. We love entertainment. I mean, as humans. <clears throat> it's extraordinary to observe this and my career as a pro was of course based on this people got excited as you were sharing to watch the new video releases each year now they just happen to have access immediate access to all of those videos plus all the wild and incredible things that all the riders are doing around the entire globe instantly so it's a feast of entertainment and the 
the most skillful riders who are willing to take the most risks rise to the surface. And I don't, I mean, there's, there's positives and negatives to that for sure. It's a lot, a lot. I mean, I, I have a, I have a, a big mixed relationship with, with social media and, and how it, how it portrays mountain biking. It's not, see, and this is the thing, it's not necessarily my experience, like social media experience of mountain biking is different from the experience of mountain biking when I go out riding and I'm, when I'm riding with friends. So it's not necessarily representative of mountain biking, but it's got an influence that's for sure. And that's where my concern is, is the, is this risk-taking uh, competitive commercial. We talked about some of the materialistic drives that are so strong in, in mountain biking. It's the materialistic drives to have certain bikes and gear and it's uh, this drive to to have status through your social media. Everyone's trying to create their own following in their own little way and so you know so anyway I could just I'm just I just keep rambling on but anyway to sum it up my cons it, it takes away from the magic of mountain biking in a lot of ways this infatuation with social media those people that do do Instagram and have their Strava and measure everything and they're you know doing these intricate trail forks loops and they're just on the phone and it's just, and this links to what we could predict for the future, but it takes away from the magic of just being on your bike in nature, in the forest by yourself or with friends and, and connecting, go back to that connection piece. It's like connecting with nature and the experience of moving your body in the forest and in the desert. And instead it's moments of that, but it's, back to the phone, back to the digital, back to the measurement, that back to the objective measurement reality. It's like, where's the heart? Where's the, where's the magic? Where's the enchantment? Where, you know, where's the, where's the flow, you know, just, and, and as long as we're measuring and comparing and recording, those things become fleeting. And, and that's what I believe is the most important part of mountain biking. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree on all counts there. It's, uh, um, and I, I forget where I read a, a study where they um, had people, they were attending some event or something like that, and they had people that didn't take any pictures, didn't record any videos, and then they had the people that were there who were like, you know, pictures and videos of everything. And then they tested them on their their memory and experience of that afterwards. And they found the people that just experienced it. Right. They, they weren't mm -hmm. there trying to take pictures and videos. They actually had like better memories and a better experience than the people who were there, like trying to film and, and take pictures. And I think that we yeah. we we think it's the opposite. Right. We think that like, oh, well, I'm, I'm recording this video. I'm taking these pictures to help me remember this moment. And it's like, man, you do a, you'd actually experience and remember the moment better if you just experience the moment. And as soon have, as you take the camera out, which yeah. I, could you find that study and send it to me? Actually, I'd be curious to see that because it links to, I've got a course outlined, a new course that I'm going to launch in the spring. It's actually a challenge. It's called the digital free ride reset. Mm. And basically it goes through all of the different electronic gadgets and devices that we utilize in association with our mountain biking. It talks about the pros and cons of each of those. And then the actual challenge part is to do three rides digital free. It's, it's free riding. So it's a digital free ride reset and you're resetting yourself to experience mountain biking in its most holistic way. And yeah. each of those three rides has a theme and some things to reflect on. And, you know, it's, it's not to say that all those 
apps and devices aren't incredible and really cool, useful tools in their own way. It's just that they've hijacked our true nature and have disconnected us from that true nature. And that that's really quite sad. So I, get in touch with that and, and then choose to use the devices on top of that, but not as a replacement. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we were lucky that we remember mountain biking before social media and Strava. Yeah, you know, yeah, like exactly. like we got to experience it. Whereas, like, if you wanted to take a picture of your buddy or, or dude, I still remember like packing my little mini uh, camcorder. You know, like we would go out oh, and it's wait. like, okay, this this ride, <laughs> but it would be like one. It was such a pain in the ass, right? It'd be like one out of like a hundred rides that you would actually make the effort to drag a camera or yeah. a video camera out on the trail to record it. And it was just, it was just riding. It was just, you know, there was the only reason we were riding was to ride. It wasn't to get a picture to post, post on Instagram or to get a video to post on TikTok or whatever. Like the only reason to go out on my bike was to just go out on my bike. That there was no other, uh, you know, no other reason. In fact, I, I used to get paranoid about, people filming me because you can't the thing is is you know someone's filming you right it's like uh shooting freud's cat or whatever the fuck it is right that like you opening the box yeah might blow the cat up or not but you don't know it's but you observing something changes it right it and so yeah. you filming someone changes their experience yeah and it changes your experience it does and yeah. i remember i used to get paranoid about like you know the mountain biking gods are you know they don't like hubris and so you know i i know it wasn't necessarily true but like i would i'd be you know i would i would film stuff but i would not film a lot of stuff because i felt like i'm actually going to increase my chance of something bad happening because i am filming this yeah and whether it was all in my head or not but it uh you know it it, it does change your does. experience when you're being filmed versus not, or, or having a picture taken or whatever, but totally. it's, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's funny, man. I've, For I've sure. told this story I, about Strava. Like I, first time I tried Strava, I went, I, you know, I thought it was cool. And then I went out on a ride one time and I felt really good about my ride and I got back to my car and I checked my Strava time and I was slower than I thought I should have been. And I felt bummed. And I was like, dude, oh, fuck this. Like, what am That's I doing? Terrible. Yeah. What am I doing? Yeah. Like my whole experience about this ride just turned a little negative because of what Strava told me. And like I raced Strava and I've never used it since. And uh, you know, I was like, why, why would I want to impose that on my ride? You know, like again, there's a time and a place, maybe if you're, you know, training for racing or, you know, there's, there's definitely a, a time for data collection and stuff like that. Totally. But, totally. you know, there's still a time to just go out and ride for fun and, you know, screw what Strava tells you, screw what, you know, uh, trying to get pictures and videos to, to post and get likes and stuff like that. Like just, just go have fun and experience it. And, mm. you know, it's, it's a different, different way of experiencing riding than, you know, having to pull your phone out uh all the time and and take pictures and film everything sort of thing but yeah it's, uh, totally yeah yeah I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll look for that study it's interesting i definitely want you to let me keep me in the loop with that because i would like to get that out to my uh you know people as well to let them know about the challenge and, and see if they'd like to get involved with it because i think that's something that that's an awesome idea that's a really good uh i think positive way to go about it because it's easy to just be yeah. negative right and complain about it but then what do we do about it right mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you're you're offering a kind of a positive some structure um, for that yeah 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 man that's 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 awesome man so but yeah that's i know you see man it's i watch some of these uh these, these videos especially like the the friday fails on pink bike man you, i'm watching some of those things and you can tell like these people, a lot of them have no business doing what they're trying to do. No. Right. And so why are they trying it? Right. Well, because they've seen someone else do it. Someone's got a camera on them and they've yeah. got this pressure to try this and do this. And it's like they don't really have the skills and the mindset and all that stuff in place to really do it. 
but they don't know any better. They think like, well, this is mountain biking because this is what social media tells me mountain biking is. And it's like, man, you know, you're going to rip people's experiences and get them hurt that way. Oh, it's sad and scary. Yeah. And it's also Friday fails is this entertainment for us. It's pretty gross and in a lot of ways because it is we're we're getting entertained by someone else's pain and life you know it's these injuries that you're seeing occur on friday fails are life-changing you know these people yeah. are these people are getting messed up and we don't see that part but that's what's happening and yeah we're numb to it it's like oh ha 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 there's another crash and it's like we're just casually passively watching these and becoming more and more desensitized to the fact that hey these are human beings that sadly have succumbed to as you said some pressures or have this idea of conquering this line so they could post it and share it with their friends on social media and or whatever it is they've seen it before so they think oh it must not be that hard or whatever it is but this wouldn't happen in prior to social media for sure and you know everyone's on their own journey through life and maybe the people who are featured in these videos or some of them just needed to get this wake up call everyone's on their own journey and that's their path and they've got to deal with an injury and learn from it and evolve and but i guess i don't know maybe in a way social media is this way for helping the whole world wake up a little bit everyone's like getting accelerated through all these like harsh wake up calls of like you know the, under the influence of social media people are taking more risks in mountain biking and realizing that fuck this is not cool. This is, I've got to wake up. I've got to rearrange my priorities and get some things in order and, and adjust for the future. Otherwise I'm not going to have much of a future. So, and yeah. you know that you, you take that to all the domains that social media, all our lives. And it's like, okay, yeah, I guess trying to look cool and beautiful or try to try to show off all my material goods on social media. Oh yeah. That's a dead end. And then it's like, a, a, you know, maybe someone discovers that the materialistic status seeking life isn't actually worthwhile. And they figure that out at 26 instead of 45 or something like that. And then in yeah. a way, in a way, like, okay, cool. Thanks, social media. For, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. There's another uh, random on the cuffs philosophical uh, interpretation yeah. of the goods no, of social man, media. I, yeah, I think that's a good, you know, I, I think there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, possibility of that. I think that, <laughs> you know, I remember back in the day, again, like going back to like, you know, the old, you know, cranked and, and new world disorder videos and stuff. And like, they'd always have the, uh, the, the fail section, right? The crash section where they would show like where things didn't go so well. And, you know, it was funny because it was like, it was different than Friday fails, right? It wasn't, you weren't watching that like laughing, right? You were, you were appreciating what was going on to be able to nail what they were doing, right? Like mm -hmm. you, and, and also, and, and I would use them as a way, I remember this, like, you know, way back in the day, like uh, watching those and being like, see, like, okay, he would try to hit this drop and he crashed in the crash section but he made it in the, you know, in the edit. Right. And so go back and look and see like, well, what was different? Right. Mm. Cause like the, it wasn't just random. Right. It wasn't like, you know, the hand of God just reached down and smacked him in the head and everything else was the same. It was like, Oh, his weight was too far forward or too far back or, you know, his, you know, rear wheel touchdown uh, real soon and, and the front wheel slapped down real hard and, and caught. So, you know, I actually would break down video to see like, well, what was successful versus unsuccessful so that I could then try to like emulate that in my own writing. 
which mm. uh, it was one of those things later on I realized wasn't normal and most people weren't doing that, but that's what, you know, I'm a coach. So it, uh, I think it was just kind of more my, my nature, but you know, the few times I do watch the Friday fails videos when they, they come across my feed, I'm, I'm more like watching to see like, you know, what are people doing that's causing them to wreck, right? It's not entertainment yeah. from like a ha ha standpoint yeah. as much as like, Oh, you can see that dude's weight was, you know, totally out of whack or, you know, but like I said, like, that's where I can say, like, you can tell most of these people have no business trying what they're trying because you can see that like that skill set that's required to, to do that isn't there. And, you know, versus seeing someone who can do it. So if you're comparing, if you're using it as a way to look at like, okay, people who are successful versus unsuccessful and what's the difference so that I can be more conscious and move towards a successful way of doing this. I think that that has a lot of value, but again, I don't think that that's quite exactly what our culture is uh, promoting those videos for. Uh, sure. And what the entertainment value as opposed to a learning opportunity for people. But it's uh, again, it's like everything else, man. It's like uh, you know, it's what you you do it right? like it's you know, like guns don't kill people people kill people right it's like social media doesn't make people go and do stupid shit right like people do shit and it's it's up to us what we get out of it and so if you're if you're using it to like learn and, and grow a person versus just mindless entertainment I think there's a lot of value there, but I, I, again, unfortunately, I don't think that that's the approach a lot of people take because that's not the approach that they're told is possible or, you know, told to, to, you know, to try and emulate, but it's, um, but yeah, so if anybody's watching, the, you know, listen to this and, you know, we're definitely not saying like, just cancel your social media because <laughs> you know, there is value to it, right? Like, yeah. it, but it's, it's, what do you do with it? Right. Like what, who, yeah, who are mean, you following? What are you totally. following them for? I think a lot of, I mean, what we're saying and chatting about, it's obvious to everyone listening. Most of everyone listening, I'm sure has thought about the things we're talking about on some level. The challenge I think is how can you be present when you are scrolling through social media? Is there is there an ability to have that meditative perspective, that witnessing experience as you're scrolling or are you lost in it? Are you passively unconsciously consuming and watching those videos and then scrolling to the next thing and, and scrolling like this comment, scroll, comment? So how much awareness and presence can you bring to the experience? And I think that is the biggest challenge and the greatest opportunity as well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, man. I think that, you know, and that's something that I, again, like I really like about your approach, you know, like there's, there's a lot of people out there that teach skills and you're one of the few people that I like recommend people check out because I, your approach is a holistic approach towards it um because one of the things that you talk about a lot is uh evaluating risk right? like you know how how do you put yourself in a position where you are most likely to be able to to find a flow state and be successful versus just you know hanging on by your fingernails and praying to the mountain biking gods that they're going to get you through this uh mm -hmm. situation and mm -hmm. so i guess kind of you know in in, in working with the, the RLC community, I mean, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from like helping people like have more awareness and bring more kind of uh, consciousness towards, you know, risk taking? Because man, what we do is dangerous, right? Like mountain biking is a dangerous sport. And I, you know, I think a lot of people don't like to say that because it sounds like we're being negative, but that's not it, right? Like the, the danger is what makes it fun on some mm -hmm. level. That, but mm -hmm. it's calculated risk taking, right? Like, you know, I got to where I was able to hit like a, you know, a 40 foot double um, at the the ranch, you know, the one of the free ride spots we had around here was on the free ride mountain bike tour for a couple of years. But, you know, right. I wrecked yeah. trying to jump off a curb when I first started riding. I still remember like just piling myself into the fucking street, 
trying to yeah. like jump off a curb, right? And so there was a progression from like wrecking off of a curb to being able to confidently hit a 40 foot gap jump. And, you know, where there's like dire physical consequences if things go wrong. And, but that, you know, that progression was, it was an intentional progression, both mentally, physically, spiritually. Mm. And I think that that's something, and that's why I always love, like, I think mountain biking, it's such a great vehicle for self-improvement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what I think that you really try to help people understand. Yeah. And, and yeah. The game. Yeah. To- no, thanks for that share, sharing that and your own journey. And I, you know, that holistic journey, you, you, you were all in on all levels of your being as you're progressing and you were, you were, you were in it and, and that's huge. And the, tr- so what I'm, what I'm excited about is, is exactly what you said is that mountain biking is an opportunity for waking up and growing. And that happens just by mountain biking in general, for sure. But if we're intentional about it, we can really speed up that development. And I've spread out that sentiment throughout all my courses and even have specific topics and, and, practices throughout the online library about these things. But I'm actually, once I've launched this new platform, I've been actually, I've been developing a a cohort based program for riders to go through it. The the first one's called the enhanced rider program. And, you know, might as well tease it here. It's, it's outlined and it's coming together, whether I get it launched in time for the first cohort to go through next year. I don't know. We'll see, but there's a a, a rider component and then there's a, a coach component. If you've done the rider one, then you can, you know, coaches can then take the, the coach one and it's a certification style program. And it's going to be, it's holistic. I mean, it's, it's really, that's what it comes down to. So in terms of, in terms of risk, you know, that's really, that's, gosh, I mean, there's so much to learn from mountain biking through our ability to deal with and handle risk. And gosh, it's just so it's so easy to, to not, to offload, like just in, in general, to, to stay safe in mountain biking, it's, it's, it's so easy for riders to just get stuck in their head and get into these, these head games. And unless we can get that sorted out, then things are going to remain being risky. If, If you don't know as a rider, what what it is you're actually trying to accomplish what's important to you what what do you what result do you really want to get like you got to get razor clear about that otherwise you're going to be you're going to be just following along with your you know getting pressure to do this and that and social media will influence you in all these ways and you'll be on the friday fail video before you know it and so you got to get to you got to turn the light in on yourself in some pretty serious ways if you want to have a long fulfilling mountain bike life and that's what I believe is the most important thing this is a sport that you can enjoy for a lifetime and you've got to choose you got to choose how you want to ride and if you do if if it turns out to be the case that you you really want to push your edges and you want to you want to take some risks, get clear about that and be clear that, hey, I'm willing to, to have an injury in order to accomplish these goals. And if you're clear about that, then you can get it out of your head and you can proceed with executing a line with full commitment and you build up to that and you methodically make that happen and you're on board you're whole, wholly on board and you can accomplish that and and it, like it's incredible what is possible if you're aligned as a being but as soon as you're following someone else's program or you know following someone else's vision or dream or things 
things get squirrely, things go sideways. And that's whether it's a social media group or whether it's your riding group, you know, choose your riding friends and wisely. Uh, these are, these are all. So anyway, I'm super pumped about digging more into these types of things and supporting riders to, to really get clear and to progress and learn and practice developing as, as not just a rider, but developing as a human being to thrive you know, for the times that they are riding the bike and to enjoy, I mean, the, the amount we can enjoy riding is a never, it's like, there's no limit to the, to how, like, there are some, there are physical limitations as to what you can accomplish on the bike, but your enjoyment of mountain biking is, is unlimited. Like you can, you can continue to expand your awareness and your consciousness to just take in more and more, like, you can just feel the inner world is, is endless. And it's, you know, so that, I mean, really that's, that's what's exciting. So, yeah, yeah, no, man, <laughs> I, I totally agree, man. It's that, it's that spiritual journey that I think is, um, like I said, mountain biking, such a great vehicle for that. If you'll let it be that, uh, for you, but like you say, you gotta be clear on, on what you want and is this really what you want? And, you know, like I said, like, you know, being okay with being hurt. Like, you know, I, I've, I've joked with people, like I've sacrificed many body parts to the mountain biking gods and some of them more than once. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, but that was at that time I was willing to do that. I mean, I knew that that was a risk. I remember my dad, like, man, what are you going to do if you get hurt? And it's like, I'll, I'll deal with it, man. Like I, I understand the, you know, there's a risk to what I'm doing I understand that, you know, if I get hurt, I'm going to have to to deal with that. But it was, I was okay with that because like I wanted to push my riding, like to me, like seeing, you know, could I ride something a little bit bigger? Could I, you know, again, man, I came up, you know, I started riding in 2000. That was like the heart of, you know, the free ride, you know, oh, movement. Yeah. And I still think like free ride still like mountain biking, you know, it's like just out in the woods, cruising around and you know you see something cool and maybe you're going to stop and session it a few times and try and practice it and get better at it and then you see something mm -hmm. else and you're like oh maybe i can hit that or maybe i can hit that and it's that you know that that progression but knowing like you know okay there is a risk of getting hurt like as you're pushing the edges you know there's always the risk of wrecking and when you wreck you can get hurt and and being okay with that and if you're not like that's totally fine too because i'll tell you like right now at 46 I'm not okay with it. I'm not <laughs> yeah, near totally. as, okay as I was, right? Like I'm not hitting no 40 foot doubles right now. It, it's <laughs> no. just, it, it's not the same because my, my risk to benefit ratio changes. You know, one, I don't bounce as well as I used to, right? I just, you know, at 26, I'd hit the ground and freaking, you know, a week later I'd be fine. And now I'd be out for like three months. And so, you know, you got the physicality changes, but also you know, I got kids, I've got, you know, just different priorities in life. And so those things change. And so yeah. it's totally okay if you don't want to do that stuff. If you don't want to be like, you know, hitting jumps and hucking yourself off of everything, you know, trying to, you know, ride rad stuff for, you know, videos and, and whatever is, is totally fine. But if you are doing it because you feel like you have to, like, I think that's what you're saying. Like people get, uh, you know, they start doing things and they don't really, they're not really clear on why am I doing this? What do I really want from riding? And am I okay with the, the risk to benefit ratio uh, of what I'm doing? And that's where people get in over their heads and could potentially, you know, ruin mountain biking for them. Like people, yeah. I've known yeah. people who have quit riding because they got hurt real bad and yeah. they're like, I'm not going to do that again. It's and sad. So yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. It's no, it's no good when we lose people for, uh, for, for reasons like that, but it's, um, but yeah, I think that that mindset part of it is, uh, is a big thing. I think, um, like visualization is a big part of, you know, progressing as a writer, uh, as well. That was something, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about like, you know, my ability to visualize myself, you know, hitting something or trying something because the first time you go off of a jump or a drop, you don't want that to be the first time you've done it in your head too, right? Like, no, you, I, no. man, I'm sure you like a lot when you were, uh, 
pushing those boundaries. I mean, you know, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you would, you know, use that or what your thoughts on, on visualization is for, for helping people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime there's a rest, anytime that it's above the normal riding realm, and obviously that's subjective for each rider, anytime you're doing something that is a potential risk, visualization is a must. It's essential. It's um, mandatory. Otherwise, it is a risk. Otherwise, you're just rolling the dice. And I don't want, I never wanted to roll the dice with my body and risk injury because, well, I mean, it sucks being injured and it, it always has for me as a mountain biker. And I also was making my money through riding. And if I was injured, I wouldn't be able to film another video or to perform another show. And so I had to get real dialed at assessing risk and making calculated decisions on what and what I would ride and what I wouldn't. And, you know, you get ego mixed up in that and that's really challenging. It's really Hmm. tough to, to say, to say no to a riding line, you know, even as a pro riding with a group of friends or as a guest rider to say no to a sketchy bit of trail or a, a gap or something that I wasn't comfortable with, you know, that's a, a reputation. It's a, a dangerous, dangerous thing to do if you're concerned, if you're really concerned with your ego, you know, and not clear on your, your, what's important to you. And so th- I struggled with that through my pro career for sure, but managed to, you know, knock on wood, uh, you know, my vision, I would say my visualization game was strong enough that it allowed, it prevented me from breaking a single, I never broke a bone through my whole pro career. And so, you know, I had a few, uh, some knee tweaks and injuries here and there and repetitive strain injuries, but managed to avoid major injury and visualization is a huge thing for that. And it takes, it t- takes practice. Definitely. It does. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, that's, I think that's something that, uh, again, like just like anything else, practice makes you better at it with the visualization, but there's a lot of, you know, research like sports psychology was one of the areas that I, you know, really like to get into one as a coach helping athletes get better, but also for my own, I mean, half of what I get into is for my own selfish, <laughs> uh, motivations. Like I want to get better at it. And like, how do you get better mm-hmm. at something? You coach it. Right. And mm-hmm. so, but that, you know, the sports psychology stuff, but there's a lot of research that shows that like, if you visualize something very vividly, right. Like, especially like a, from the first person perspective, you mm-hmm. see it, you feel it. It's like, it's firing off the same neurons in your brain as if you were actually physically doing it. You know, mm-hmm. on, on some level, your mind does not know the difference between what you're visualizing and actually doing in, in reality. And so the, the better you get with visualization, the more vivid you're able to make it, the more you're able to feel it in your body. Like, you know, I know what it feels like to hit a jump, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's a physical feeling to hitting a lip and just the, the sensation that comes from that. And, and so being able to inject that you know take your visualization to that level where you're physically there you're you're mentally there it's all and then when you hit it it's not the first time in your mind that you've hit it right like you come off that jump and it's not like holy shit what's going on here it's like no, no, no i've been here before i've oh, yeah. seen this before yeah. you know and and obviously you're having to deal with you know little things that, that come up but that's part of what's you know, fun. That's where that flow state comes from is like, can you just like turn off the the thinking brain and just let yourself react and, and, and be in the moment? And it's so much easier to do that if you've been able to use visualization uh, beforehand. And, you know, that's one of those skills that can help you in life, man. If you've got, you know, yeah. a freaking speech you got to deliver, you got a difficult conversation you have to have with a spouse, you have a uh, 
you know, whatever it is, anything that's, you know, difficult that has some sort of risk involved may not be a physical risk, but it may be risk of, you know, uh, hurting someone's feelings or, or being embarrassed or in, on stage mm-hmm. or whatever it is. If you mm-hmm. visualize yourself doing that ahead of time, it's going to help you. Uh, and so I think, again, that's one of those things that mountain biking teaches us that we can carry over into our everyday life that just makes us better, you know, more competent, more successful uh, human beings if we, again, allow mountain biking to be that vehicle to help us uh, to, you know, teach that. But, you know, again, I think that's it's it's not something that gets talked about a lot. Right. Like what is that mental side of riding the bike um you know it's uh it, I remember, yeah. uh old jared graves and his pin it you know, pin it you fairy right it's like that's that's one mindset right just and, and again jared's one of those dudes like he says that but you know that dude's you know he's he's he, he says that because he's been able to take his game to that level he's not yeah. just pinning it unnecessarily with stupid risks <laughs> no you know but people can take it the wrong way, right? Like this, like macho, like just, man, just go for it, bro. Just, you know, hit it oh, and see what gosh. happens. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. The, I, I had a, the, one of the, one of the names I was going to call the, the mindset part of the new website. I was thinking about calling it transcend and I was going to, it's like the, the, one of the taglines is going to be transcend the send culture. Because you do. Yeah. I mean, the send culture is just that. Oh, just send it, bro. And it's like, just, which, I mean, as I say, in, in a way, there is the, the, ad, the like, just, just send it or just, just do it. There is a certain element of that that can be thought of as, okay, just do it. Don't question it. Just, just do it. Just, just send it get your head out of it and just, just send it. But sadly wrapped up in that, just send it is more stupidity than not <laughs> just because just, yeah. just send it. Most people don't actually, a lot of riders don't have the skill to, to work the inner game, to work the visualizations, to, to build up to it. It's, it's on the, it's on the fly influence from others and encouragement from others that inspires them to just send it and that's that's the rolling the dice style of riding that just ugh, is hard to watch yeah yeah oh man i i know exactly what you mean man there's nothing more nerve-wracking than watching someone drop in on something that you're like dude i know you should not be doing this yeah and that's but why like, i always that's why i always say like be you know people like it seems that it's it seems that when you're you know you're riding with friends when you're like i i generally never encourage people to do anything on the trail i don't say oh yeah you got it you you know you you totally got this you know don't don't worry about it you got it you can do it no problem i want them to come to that realization themselves i don't want to be i don't want to be you know in it's generally what I've observed is that's thought of as a good thing to do and to offer. But when you're talking about a sport that can be as risky as mountain biking, you gotta be real careful about how, how you encourage someone. You can be encouraging of someone in a far more skillful and nuanced way than just saying, yeah, you got it. You got it. Just send it. It's like, no, bring, you gotta bring a lot more sophistication to your encouragement game for your friends and or your your clients yeah yeah no man for sure that's definitely it's uh because there's i mean i've i totally agree with that i have been there's a couple times when you know a riding buddy that i mean i know them I, like i know that they've got this and they're in their head and so there have been times when i have been like dude you've got this right like you know i don't right. want you to hit it if you're not comfortable with it but I'm telling you, you've got this. I know that you've got the skills and, and, but it's not like it's coming from a place of being informed, right? It's Again, not just got, like, yeah, you've got information. You, you're, you're thinking about it, you know them intimately. And so that's the nuance. There's some nuance in that encouragement. Right. It's not just a blank. It's not just a blank. Yeah. You got this, go for it. Like, 
Yeah, yeah, no, it's like I know, I, you know, based on the information I have and the context, I can say that and it, it, you know, means something more than just being like, oh, you know, everybody's just saying that uh, mindlessly, just trying to be encouraging. But again, I think, like you said, I think you got a lot of well-meaning um, writers who are trying to encourage new writers who aren't thinking about that, you know, and they, they think that they're being encouraging and they're being positive when what they're really doing is kind of encouraging a, you know, a risk that may not necessarily be there and, and not really the mindset that you need to be able to, uh, you know, to, to approach that risk um, properly. And, you know, the, yeah. the problem is, again, like I've worked with a lot of writers that, you know, top writers and, and just in, in sports in general, right? Like a lot of people who are really good at something don't necessarily know why they're good at it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like Michael Jordan's not a coach for a reason. Right. Like he's, he's it's tough for him to coach because he's just so goddamn good at basketball. It's like, how do you coach someone who sucks? Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, it's why you usually find like you're, you're a really interesting exception to the rule, which is a high level mm -hmm. athlete who actually is a good coach because you have uh, really thought about and were intentional about what you did both while you were an athlete and then now as you transition to more of a coaching role, but, you know, uh, unfortunately that's not the way it is. And most times, like yeah. the people who are the most naturally talented are usually some of the worst coaches. Mm -hmm. You find this across yeah. the board. It, it's not yeah, just mountain it's biking, true. right? But yeah. you look at like, the best rider in your group, right? And you're like, oh man, he's doing this. And he tells me I can do it. Or, and he says to do it this way without mm -hmm. realizing like, man, like he may not actually know how to, you know why he's successful or she's successful and be able to translate that for you and help you achieve the same thing and mm -hmm. you know again it's one of these things like you know the, the more that people like understand that and are able to kind of take a step back and be like okay you know there's a difference between being a good writer and being a good coach totally um, yeah you got to know who you're, yeah you got to know who you're coaching you got to know that person's where that person's at in order to to coach them accurately and you know and again that's why the connection aspect of my online business is is so fundamental because there's and and why it's been so fundamental to break down lessons into small pieces because that someone can try something if it's not clear, they can ask a question and fine tune it. Uh, and this links back to what I was thinking about in terms of something practical for people listening to this and links to the visualization. And for the visualization, for visualization to work, you also, you do need data. You, you need you, the, the experience and visualization, experience, visualization. You gotta, you gotta work those two constantly in through the process. And so every time you go and practice it's like oh cool you've got more data to increase the definition of your visualization and then you just practice again then you've got a higher definition visualization to bring back and and it works off of each other and so uh you know just because you're really good at visualizing doesn't mean you can all of a sudden jump this you know do a bigger right. leap um move it's like no you still got to be real smart about how you're gaining the extra experiential data to add to the visualization, which will help you get clear about the next experience to take and whether it's safe or not. So. Oh, totally. I mean, again, go back to my, you know, jumping experience. It's like once I was able to jump off a curb and not wreck, you know, it was like, oh, well, that like ledge over there. I think that I can hit that. And then, you know, and it progressed and it was like, you know, the jumps I didn't go from like a, you know, 10 foot gap to a 40 foot gap. It was like, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25. There was like a, you know, that, that progression. And it was like, I still remember the day I hit the 40 footer and I was like, you know, hitting the jump before it, which was about a 30, 35 foot gap. And, and I was like, I was like, man, I got this. Like, I know that, I, you know, I, I, I got to where I was comfortable at that level and I could visualize myself at just a little bit higher level. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well now I can like achieve that level physically. And then I can, you know, visualize myself, 
hitting, you know, uh, or doing something else. And so, but there is that, that, that interplay, right? Like in the gym, just I can visualize myself deadlifting a thousand pounds. Doesn't mean I'm going to go in and deadlift a thousand pounds. Like I've got to, you know, progressively work my way up to that. And so there is the physical and the mental side of it that you've got to mm-hmm. be, be one, one feeds the other, right? And, yeah, and that's totally. A part of it. Yeah. And yeah, that's like been the fun, up. yeah. And that's been the fun part about how I design courses because it's like, not everyone knows what the next logical accessible drill is for them to practice. What, like, how do I go from, from here to there? It's like, okay, there's all these different things you can experiment and try to, to bring you to the point of being able to do that more difficult thing. And so it's a real, I mean, really, I think of, I've always thought of myself more of a creative person and it's the same with coaching. Coaching is a real creative process and it's been really, you know, part of what inspires me as a coach is coming up with unique original progressions and and methodology to guide someone through a a learning process to give them all those different experiences so they have all this data to to work towards that end result and to become more familiar with how their body moves with their bike and so yeah it's been it's been really cool to just to i mean it's it's really great to to see to see riders succeed and to to be blown away by what they've been able to learn when they put their mind to it and when they really focus and work through material so nice so just kind of touching on that just kind of uh growing as a coach i mean uh have you had any kind of you know aha moments or just kind of things you realize like that you've you've learned or or you know are doing better or just I guess kind of uh, what are some of the the progressions and, and things that you you feel like you've learned um, you know over the last seven years of of focusing more on on coaching and helping people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I you know one thing is many riders will purchase coaching in order to offload the responsibility of learning onto the coach. Mm. And that's a trap. So, yeah, it's 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 something that can lead to so so that's a trap, and that can also lead to overanalyzation, you know, analysis paralysis, and and that's that's a trap online because you can't necessarily see if the rider is actually going out and doing the practice to get the data they might be just intellectualizing and doing the course in their head which of course it doesn't work you need the physical experience you know so so that's also something i've been uh observing and yeah again just the the difference between wanting to learn something because wouldn't oh wouldn't it be cool if i was able to do a long manual versus no i this is something i'm dedicated to i'm i'm gonna you know i i believe i can do it i'm gonna do everything i can to learn it and you know i'm gonna just i mean you know there's the there's the would like to be able to do something and then there's the okay i'm i'm driven i'm going to i'm going to figure this out and there's a big you know that again the the there's a if you don't have a clear belief about what it is you're working on what it is you're progressing towards do you believe that it's possible in in there's no there's no way you're gonna learn it if if the intention isn't clear or if it's not for the right reasons and so so that's where it's whether online coaching or in-person coaching getting clear about those things is is so key and also just the fact that you 
you know, I think one of the great, one of the great things about, you know, I did in-person coaching for 20 years and before I started online coaching. And for me, the, my effectiveness as a coach has just skyrocketed through the ability to use these technologies, this online material to, to coach. Cause I can coach, you know, I'm, I'm there 24 seven for my customers, the members and learning takes time. And so having reference video drills and the ability to interact along the way is so key because you need, again, it's like, cool, all through the year, someone can have an on bike experience practicing something and then reflect and ask a question and have another on bike experience following the drill versus I always struggled in person coaching. It was great. I could, I could pinpoint something and correct something in that moment, but the whole rest of everything I taught was just in the head of the students. And that, that just disappears after the, the weekend. It's like all the, you know, you're teaching someone, you're sharing everything, you know, in person and everyone's having, ah, oh yeah, that makes sense. And all these like light bulbs go off, but lasting results is not what is accomplished in, you know, a, a day clinic or a weekend clinic. It takes it's a journey. It's like a multi-year journey to to really secure those skills. Yeah, yeah. No, those are uh, yeah, those are good good insights. I mean, I've kind of in my journey had some some similar uh, <clears throat> you know lessons like that. You know, the coach can't provide mm-hmm. if you're not motivated and have that belief. Yeah, you know, the coach is just a guide, right? Like they're yeah. not going to be able to do it for you. No, and no. Yeah, if you're not willing to do the work, it's you know they can't. Uh, co-opt out but also the I think that's one of the things that um, you know again the the culture of the skills training and and coaching community um, again I don't know if it's that it's on purpose or it's just kind of like the expectations of the clients but it's like you know they think they're gonna be able to show up to a one-day clinic or a weekend clinic and that they're gonna walk away being a markedly better rider and and odds are pretty low of that, right? Like you may, you may have one or two things that you're able to fix and help someone with that makes a difference, but Mm -hmm. it's really like them being able to take that and then, you know, you use that as a guide for where they're going with their journey after that. And in fact, I would, I would tell people like, look, we're going to, we're going to reach a point, you know, when we're this weekend where like your physical limitations, right? Like you may not be able to move properly to uh to corner properly right or you may not be able so like we're going to run up against your kind of physical and mental limitations and so Mm -hmm. and that's totally fine right but it's like that's you're going to have to work past those limitations after you leave here to be able to actually really truly use all the information that i gave you versus thinking that we're going to walk in and within three days you're going to be like an expert at cornering or an expert at jumping or something like that when the odds mm-hmm. of that are, are pretty low but yeah I'm, I'm not expecting to be a markedly better rider after this clinic but i expect to have a better direction and some tools to yeah. use to help me on my journey i think that's a, a better better way to approach uh that stuff but you got to do the work right yeah. and that's i think the, the drilling, I, that was one of the things that in my, um, you know, I did a post on, you know, some of the lessons I learned from getting my jujitsu black belt. And one of those things was like, drill, there's drill, a lot drill, for drill, getting better baby. jujitsu. It is. It's like you identify a problem, you identify a solution to that problem, you drill that solution, and then you, you use that solution. And that's the process. And then guess what happens? Well, there's a new problem. Well, I got to find a new solution. I got to drill that and then I got to implement it. And then that's going to un- uncover a new problem that I have. And it's just a never ending process. And if that's the, the way that you're approaching it, then, you know, you're again, it's this lifetime process of improvement that you open up for yourself. But like there's no getting around that uh, that process, like yeah. the, the people that drill progress so much faster and get so much better on the mats than mm. people that don't. And it's yeah. part of the culture 
in jujitsu, like you drill, like this is how you get better. It's part of the process. And I think that mountain biking has gotten better about that with people understanding the importance of drilling. But, uh, you know, I still don't know if it's that level. Like, I, and again, I don't know if I, remember, I may have told you this story. I don't know if you remember, uh, but I think Cranked 3 was the first mountain bike video I ever saw. And you had an edit in it. And I remember watching you like, like side hop from one log to another log. And I'm going like, oh, well, that looks like a cool skill. So I'm out in my front yard, you know, in front of my house uh -huh. and I'm practicing hopping up onto a curb and then hopping down off of the curb and just lifting my rear wheel up and down and just, cool. dude, I would <laughs> nice. spend you know hours just so drilling. And again, you know, yeah. I, you know, watching you, some of the stuff was some of that inspiration for that, but that, that helped me immensely with my skills on the trail. So as much as I loved riding, mm. it wasn't always riding like i i had drill time and again it's one of those you know i don't it's just one of those weird things that i was doing and i looked back on and was like oh well that was different than what most people do and and yeah, hopefully totally. i can help people figure out how to use that themselves but um but yeah that drilling aspect of uh you know riding is yeah. just it's so important so 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 important and i think so like you said like giving people a, a blueprint because again, if they don't know what to drill, and they don't know well, kind of what's the what's the progression, what's kind of the next thing to move towards. It's real easy to not do it, mm -hmm. and so you know, like you're saying, like having those those uh, things that you provide through the RLC, I think, is super valuable for people because mm -hmm. they, you know, you got to drill, but you need some sort of a blueprint for yeah. how you're gonna do it. Yeah. So that's a big big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty, it is pretty cool. And the, the coach thing, yeah, like, well, two things, the baseline balance skills course, hopping, rocking and track stand. So that is the curb. It's amazing how much you can learn on a curb. And any, everyone's got a curb at their disposable, at their disposal. And so I think that's partly why that course has been one of the most popular courses I created. I did that one like five or six years ago, and it's been a core foundational course for people to work through you know those three skills hopping rocking and track stands are slow speed balance skills but they are incredibly powerful to support your higher speed riding as well because you know whether you're going fast or slow some of those balance moves still come into play and and it's intimacy with the bike you're spending time on your bike connecting with your bike and you know that can be done yeah. at home which is the which is a revolution this is a revelation for a lot of riders it's like oh i can practice at home or at the park which is really yeah. great one of the actually it's it's been chatting with some of my couple of my coaches on it's it's interesting that the geometry of bikes now is getting further and further away from being conducive to at home slow speed practice yeah yeah it's uh but, yeah but that's, whatever. that it's, is it's 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 an overcome you, people can overcome that but it is it, it there is a trend in bike geometry to be less favorable to the slower speed or trial z style moves yeah not something i've but that's I've, another uh, topic noticed <laughs> myself as well yeah. yeah no man but that, that balance thing is i think is a good uh, thing for people to you know to think about because your your balance is you know it's like Mr. Miyagi said in the Karate Kid right like balance good karate good balance bad may as well go home and mm -hmm. it's it's true on on the bike as well and you know track stands are such a core I mean that is your slow speed balance right because like, like people if you think about it uh, you can ghost ride a bike right like a bike can balance itself if it has enough momentum it doesn't need you on it and mm -hmm. so many people don't realize that they can't actually balance on their bike, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're always relying on momentum to help them balance. And mm -hmm. so you look at the things a lot of people struggle with, things like, you know, uh, navigating through rock gardens, technical climbs, switchbacks are another thing. I guarantee you if someone struggles with switchbacks, they aren't good at track stands and they're not good with switch foot uh, mm -hmm. riding. If you yeah. have those two skills in your back pocket, you don't need someone, you don't need to go to a clinic to tell you how to do a track stand you can they're they're not i mean a, a switchback they're yeah. not that difficult if you have those skills but again like 
I was practicing those things in front of my house, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was doing that, that stuff. And so and you had you had the time to study the videos and to figure it out. You were doing you were doing the work you to, to figure it out and to watch the videos. And so, yeah, I mean, that's where a coach comes in. You know, I've I've helped to speed up that whole process of, you know, it's like, yes. OK, OK, everyone, here's here's the here's the path. You can just follow the path. You don't have to recreate it. You don't have to figure out all the steps yourself. This is like bite-sized little video tutorials that will walk you through it. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah just do the, do the work. You know? Yeah. It's so like, people just, they consider stuff like that to be like too simple, right? They all want to get into jumping and cornering and all these higher level yeah. skills and without yeah. taking the time to establish those baseline skills of like being able to mm -hmm. just do a track stand, front wheel lift, the rocking, the, and again, I'm a huge advocate for switch foot riding. I believe that you, you mm -hmm. should be able to ride either foot forward to about like 80% of your skill level, right? Like you'll always have one mm -hmm. foot that you're going to forward that you're going to be more comfortable with, you know, okay. your super high skill things. But if you can't ride at the same, like if you go to the switch foot and your skills just fall apart, like that's a big gap in your, yeah. in your, it's a big risk. And, it's a big, it, it increases your risk. Yeah. Substantially yeah. because you, you, you just, you're guaranteed to get caught out with your non-dominant foot forward in a sketchy, challenging bit of trail. And yeah. if you're not, if you haven't intentionally practiced with that switch foot with that other foot forward, then you'll feel real vulnerable and exposed. Oh, dude, I know. That was one of the things that got me, I remember, yeah, that happened to me a couple of times. And then uh, also in the uh, the Book of Five Rings, Miyamoto Musashi, the greatest samurai who ever lived, that's his treatise on, uh, on training. And he talked about not being right-footed or left-footed because you never know which way the enemy will force you. And mm -hmm. so yeah. you're only good with one foot forward and the enemy forces you into the other foot forward, like, that could be the matter between life and death when you're playing with three foot long razor blades. But, uh, yeah. you know, but that, I remember reading that thinking like, okay, like Musashi challenges us to be ambidextrous with our, with our stances. And so yeah, and that totally. just also just thinking a couple of times getting caught on the trail with my other foot forward and feeling like, Ooh, this is really sketchy being like, all right, I got to get it. And I mean, it doesn't take that long. I have to dedicate some time to it. And, you know, I, within, you know, if you spent one riding season, just really forcing yourself to ride mm -hmm. with the other foot forward in track stands, like being able to do your track stand with your non-dominant foot forward totally. helps yeah. a lot. Yeah. And, all four, you know, yeah, and you'll totally. get to where you can ride. Either way. All four, all four combos. That's one of the more advanced lessons in the track stand module and baseline balance skills. There's four track stand positions. Yeah. When, bars turn your bar one way turn it the other way switch your foot turn it one way turn it the other way and being stable in all four configurations is really key um the samurai yeah. thing just this the samurai thing just made me think of an analogy i made about my daughter the other the other day um we're having sleep challenges and you know maybe maybe this is a good way to wrap it up um the uh I you know the last samurai that tom cruise movie yep oh yeah you know yeah it's like i mean it's a great movie it's a really great movie and there's a scene where he's pretty freshly brought into he's still an enemy but he's been he's brought brought in to recover from his injuries in in that small little remote village of of of, of samurais and so he's he, he comes out and he's they're just using the sticks to, to battle and he gets yep. knocked down knocked down but he never gives up. He's like right to the last. He's like he gets pounded down and they're just using sticks to keep him down. But he just like, but he always gets up one last time to, to give it a go. And that's just like my daughter when she's trying to avoid falling asleep. It's like <laughs> she just resists, resists. She's just like, gets pulls herself up and just and then she's getting so sloppy and she's so tired and just trying to push herself up and she's just like until she just cannot handle it anymore so anyway yeah that was like fall down <laughs> seven times get up eight you know yeah <laughs> yeah totally that's funny man that's that's a good movie they also had that good line with like too many minds 
right? Like he was, there was a, that scene where he was, you know, trying to, you know, practice and one of the guys oh, came in yeah. and he goes, you, you have, he's like, what's you, too many minds. And he's like, what? Mm. He's like, You're too many minds. You're worried about what this guy's thinking and this guy's thinking, and this guy's thinking, mm. you have too many minds. Kind of mm. goes back to like, the social media thing when you get you know when you're filming somebody and you're thinking about that it's like too many minds yeah. can uh can fuck up your skills so um oh, yeah but totally. yeah man no i think uh man we've been chatting for about an hour after so i think it's good <laughs> hey. uh good, anything good else you wanted to say or yeah. yeah man you know i it's uh no i mean I got, I got something I'm going to run by you when we, uh, when we get offline here or we get off the, the recording here. Sure, um, sure. but, uh, get run an idea by, see what you think. Uh, but no, man, I think, you know, overall we've been able to, to, you know, deliver some, some good info. I mean, you know, you sent a, a list and we could, you know, talk about like, get, you know, aging as a writer and, you know, predictions for the futures, all sorts of things we could talk <laughs> yeah. about that, you know, hopefully can get you on again here sooner rather than later. And we can, uh, you know, follow up on some of those things. But um, no, man, I think it's it's been a, a good conversation for for people as, as always, just giving them a different perspective. That's what I always like about getting you on because you have such a, a you know, a, a different perspective on what it takes to be a good writer than uh, than a lot of people do. I think that all perspectives have value, and mm. I think that uh, people to different things to think about some different food for thought um is good so hopefully we've uh we've been able to to provide that for some people to help them um enjoy riding more and riding for a lifetime man i think that's something yeah. that you know you mentioned that it's been kind of a theme of my stuff for for a little bit now is uh as you get older your your priorities shift from like trying to ride the gnar into uh how do i do this for a lifetime uh mm -hmm. sort of thing and so yeah, man, maybe we can get you back on and just kind of like chat about, uh, you know, that specifically. Uh, totally, uh, yeah. Know, that specific topic, I think it'd be good. So yeah. that's the thing I get you on. We're so irregular with this stuff. It's like we got so many topics we could talk about. That, <laughs> totally. Uh, it's tough to fit them all in into one, into one conversation. But yeah. Um, but yeah, man, no, I mean, I, I just encourage everybody to check out your, uh, the RLC. I mean, I know you're, you're doing some updates and you got a big thing, but it's still like your, your current platform is still valuable. And mm -hmm. I think that people can, can get a lot out of it now and then mm -hmm. be prepared for when you make the switch to the new platform. So, um, and cool. do, you, do you still have the flat pedal challenge? Is that still a free course that people can sign up for the, the flat pedal challenge thing? It's under the paywall right now. I've been cycling through okay. different free content. So, but that's still, oh, cool. yeah. Yeah. So there's a free, there's can... a, yeah. So check out, check out the site. There's, there's some free content as always. And uh, that digital free ride reset will be a free course when it launches. Cause I want, cool. want as many people to, get the word to out take it that. as, as I can. So, but yeah, man, I really always enjoy chatting with you, James. It's, it's, yeah, we we seem to, yeah, share a <laughs> enough vibe on things to, yeah. Yeah, man. Well, cool. All right. Well, we'll uh, sign off. Again, you guys can check me out at bikejames.com. And, and what's the, the website they can check out the RLC? Yeah, rlc-mtb.com. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll include that in the show notes so people can uh, can check that out. And uh, yeah, so hopefully everybody's enjoyed this conversation and we'll uh, talk to everybody next time. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And